Hi, I am Kate Steigler. I am the Aquatic Invasive Species Specialist for Arizona Game and Fish. I primarily work out of Lake Havasu, but I can work anywhere on the lower Colorado River. And today we're going to go through what you need to know to, ex um, to explain to boaters what they need to know about quagga mussels and other invasive species that we have in this area. Okay, so first of all, you need to know what an invasive species is. It's any non-native animal or plant that can cause economic harm, environmental harm, or harm to human health, or it can decrease the value of recreation. This is the general definition that we pretty much use across the country. So when we say invasive, we mean it implies something non-native or exotic. Exotic is from another place, another part of the world. Uh, introduced, it was brought here, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a threat. Alien means it was introduced to a particular ecosystem regardless if it causes harm or not. We do have a lot of non-native species on the Colorado River. Um, not necessarily every single one we consider invasive or harmful. What makes these things invasive and why do we think they're harmful? Typically these kinds of species proliferate really, really quickly, normally multiple times a year. Um, they disperse really easily. Do they float away in the water? Um, can they actually physically move themselves from one place to another? Uh, and then they tend to have some sort of, um, they're able to alter their growth depending on their environmental conditions. So what the, in their homeland they might have particular parameters they have to be in, but as they move to new places they might be able to adapt to those new environmental conditions. Um, and typically these species tend not to have competition because they're filling these niches that native species have typically been in, but since there's so many of them, they just tend to overwhelm what's already there. And typically there's no predator, natural predators, so it takes a long time for the natural cycle to start figuring out if they can be, this would be a great food source for them or not, but that takes thousands and thousands of years and we're getting invasions so quickly it cannot keep up with that. So how do we manage AIS, both game and fish and all of everyone across the country and the world? The best thing we can do is prevention. So getting out there, talking to people, making sure the public is aware of what's out there, whether it's on land, in the water, is it spread by boaters, is it spread by um, anglers, waders, uh, is it your gear that you're spreading it with? These are things the public needs to know, and pretty much if they know what they need to do, they're less likely to spread all of these species. But once you, unfortunately, once you get these things, they are very, very difficult to get rid of. Like quagga mussels, we haven't found a solution to remove them from open systems like rivers and lakes. You can remove them from small systems, small closed systems, but typically um, those places, it keeps getting reintroduced, so it's a constant battle with them. There are ways you can control them within like, let's say a power plant or a water treatment plant. They can control within those pipes, but that's control and not eradication. But once they're established, we want to contain what we have where we are. Lake Havasu we, is considered a containment lake. We want to keep the quagga mussels here. We want to keep our weeds here. We don't want them spreading somewhere else. But Likewise, we want other places to contain what they have. There are plenty of other water bodies in this country that have things that we don't have yet that we don't want. And regardless of where you are in the world, we are constantly spreading these things. We've gotten bees from all across the world. We have fish from Asia that come into this country. Uh, beetles, we are the carriers of these species, whether it's through our shipping or our recreation, we're transporting lots of non-natives across this country. So I'm just going to go a little bit into what Arizona Game and Fish does here and what, how you guys help us spread the message. All right, so the basis of the Aquatic Invasive Species Program for Arizona Game and Fish is outreach and education. We are, we get our boots on the ground, we get um, our specialists, our technicians, and our interns are out there on the ramps on the weekends talking to boaters, educating them whether it's through just chatting it up with them or we're doing interactive surveys which are a little bit of an educational tool that we use. We go to special events, we go to your sand and water expo, we go to the boat shows, we go talk to school groups, we, we get out there and we talk to the community about these problems. 
And not only with just the general public, Arizona Game and Fish helps other state, county, um, basically any other government agency learn how to control their AIS and to decontaminate and inspect vessels as well. So we do it internally and externally for everyone. And you guys really are another, another helping point in that outreach because there's just one of me out here in Lake Havasu and there's all of you and if we're all spreading the same message, we're doing the same work. And we really need your help doing that. What we also do is decontamination. This is typically for people who have been in the water for six or more days. So those marina-based boats, those boats that have been moored in the water. Once they've been in that water for six consecutive days or more, that count has a trigger point. At that point, the boater needs to contact Arizona Game and Fish to schedule a decontamination, whether it's through me or a private company that may offer it. There is no fee to the boater for the decontamination. If they do it at, let's say, Lake Havasu State Park where the decontamination station is, they do have to pay the day use fee to get into the park though. All right, so you guys need to know what our rules and laws are in Arizona because they are a little different than other places, but for the most part, they're all doing the same things. So we have something called director's orders. This gives us the teeth to say, what's up? These are rules and laws. So director's or we have three of them. Director's orders one is a list of species that we have or we're concerned about. Uh, director's orders two is what affected waterways do we have in the state? And three is what are the mandatory conditions for boat movement? Okay, so one is a whole list of different species. We don't necessarily have all these species in the state. We don't happen to have a Asian carp. We don't have rusty crayfish. We don't have red claw. We don't have snakehead or zebra mussel. So basically everything on the right side we don't have in this state, but we are concerned about it coming here. <laughs> everything on the left side, quaggas, New Zealand mud snails, didimo, giant sylvania, apple snail, whirling disease, larvae, about bath virus, we have. Whether it's here in Lake Havasu or throughout the state. Directors order two are our AIS affected waterways. Essentially from Lake Powell all the way to the Mexican through Mexico, there are quagga mussels, except in the Grand Canyon, but that is a different issue. I'll just move on for that one. Uh, there is uh, New Zealand mud snails, basically Lake Mead and Lake Mojave. So if you're ever up there, make sure you check your shoes, check the bottoms of your kayaks, because that mud you pick up, you can carry these teeny tiny little snails in it. And I'll show you more about them later. Uh, we have Didymo up at, by Davis Dam near Bullhead Laughlin area. Uh, Giant Sylvania is down near Blythe. Uh, apple Snails down near Yuma area. And then also, because um, of the Central Arizona project that comes out of down by Parker Dam, it goes into Lake Pleasant, which then feeds down all the way through Tucson through those cap channels. So all of that water that comes out of the Colorado River has quagga mussels in it. Uh, recently, it's, although it's not on here, this blow up here is the, um, the Salt River Lakes. So Roosevelt, Apache, Saguaro, Canyon, and Bartlett, those are all in, within the Tonto National Forest. Um, only Apache, Saguaro, and Canyon have quagga mussels. They were found there last winter and they were found by villager hits. Uh, we did DNA sampling on it, and we are now finding adults. So unfortunately, those lower Salt River lakes have it. Roosevelt and Bartlett do not, but they do have largemouth bass virus. So unfortunately, they've gotten away from us. So hopefully we can keep it out of Roosevelt and Bartlett at this point. But there's lots of other lakes in the state that don't have it um, that could potentially harbor them. Okay, so director order three, these are the rules. What, what do you got to do with your stuff? What do you got to do to your boat? Your wading gear, what do you got to do? So for day use, we split into two categories, day users. Anyone who's in the water for five days or less. Typically these are the boats that they trail or nightly, but we do give them up to five days. So if they slip for the weekend in the marina, they're still considered a day user. These people need to clean, drain, and dry their boats. So they're gonna wipe down their boats. You're gonna make sure all the plant material that happens to be on there. Is there sand and mud on there? Clean that out. We're gonna have them drain the boats, which is pulling any sort of plug 
that's supposed to have, that could have water behind it. We're not talking about the outside ones on a pontoon. We're talking about the bilge plug, uh, the live well, bait well, things like that that are supposed to have water behind it. Ski lockers, make sure you drain those as well. So if it has a plug, it's got to be pulled. And you want to keep it out so everything will dry out and ventilate. It takes a while for the air to actually start moving in there and dry everything out. And the dry thing is we need it to dry out because any of that standing water, any of those water droplets could have the potential to have villagers in it, which are the quagga mussels larva. Okay? They, they are not the hardiest of creatures, those villagers, but if they have water, they can live up to 30 days in that water. Long-term boaters are anyone over five days. So on day six, this is your trigger point where you need to do those clean, drain, and dry techniques as well as doing the decontamination and filling out the ASBER, which is our Arizona boat inspection form. And as of May 1st, this has to be done prior to transport. We consider transport when you come out of the water. That's your starting point of transfer, whether you're going up the, if you're just driving up the hill to your house, that's considered transport. Or you are going out of state. Clean the boats. So vegetation, if there's mussels on it, uh, if there's mud, uh, is there New Zealand mud snails on it, things like that. And you're going to check the boats, the trailers, the anchors. And you're definitely going to be checking anchors for day users because they put the anchor down, they scoop up some dirt, and there happens to be some mussels in that dirt. That tends to be one of those big ticket things that the California ag stations always seem to get for the quarantines, is those anchors. I think when I ran the numbers this year, 95% of the quarantine boats coming out of Arizona was all from mussels on anchors, not from fouled hulls. Okay, and we want them to pull the plugs if it's applicable. Drain the engine if you can. Uh, cooling systems, live wells, bait wells, anywhere that can potentially hold water and then you need to dry it out. In the winter time we have a much longer dry time because the temperatures are lower and the humidity tends to be higher so it takes a lot longer for things to dry out. So that's why we want those boats out for 18 plus days. Other states do have higher requirements like they're pushing 30, 40 days but those are colder climates and the research does support those dry times for them. But for us, like uh, May through October, we're only looking at seven day dry times because it's hot, it's dry, and that's very conservative. Um, so, but it's better to be conservative about the stuff and make sure these suckers are, die, are dead. Uh, there's one example of a mechanic in Phoenix. He had pulled a bolt out of Lake Pleasant in the summer. He let it sit out for a few days because he was gonna rip apart the engine anyways. He opens up that engine Keep in mind that it's been like 115 for days and days and days and days. This thing's baking in the sun. He opens it up about a week later, and they're still alive. So as long as they're moist and, and it's dark, they're pretty happy to stay alive. And they've found that these mussels can live like over 30 days outside of water, as long as they're moist. And then we're going to want to do that decon. So a decontamination means we are killing and removing as many mussels as possible. Um, killing, we're going to use hot water and we're going to, basically we're going to cook them to death for the most part. Um, so we're going to flush the engines, we're going to clean the hulls, we're going to run water through any place that had lake water in any sort of the raw water. So anything that would be in there would be dead. We might not be able to physically remove everything like if it was inside the engine. Might not be able to remove that, but we can ensure they're killed with that hot water. Um, and then last step we do is we physically remove them from the outside, whether it's scraping or flushing or using high pressure with the power washer. Um, we do our best to remove as many visible muscles as we can find. Okay, so this ASBER form, this is the Arizona boat, um, Boating Inspection Report. So this is done before transport, so pretty much at the time of decontamination, this is filled out. It's, the information is like where, Who's the boater? What's the boat? Where's it going? Where's it been? What's been done to the boat? And a new thing this year is we added, it's on here, the seal number. So starting just a few weeks ago, we're going to start sealing boats for, um, that we have decontaminated. 
it's just to show that the boat has, so once the boat transports out of state, at least the accepting jurisdiction knows that the boat has not left the trailer since the time that I decontaminated it. And then this ASBER form has to be completed, signed, and submitted to Arizona Gamble Fish before you even hit the road. And that's very important because we, at that point, we then notify whatever states that boat will be traveling through. So part of that draining is pull the plug rule. So you keep seeing those pull the plug signs around the ramps. That's what this is about. So they need to remove any plug or barrier that prevents the drainage of water. So bait wells, live wells, uh, build plugs. If it's like a tri-tune that has an IO engine, that plug has to be pulled, not the ones on either side. Um, there are some people that do pull those plugs, but that is their choice because they tend to have a lot of water in their pontoons and they can't take their boat home if they unless they do that. But those peop people typically have bigger problems going on. So. Okay, quagga zebra mussel biology. This will give you the background of why these things are so harmful and it, why we have such a problem with them and boating. Okay, so quagga and zebra mussels are freshwater bivalve mollusks. Um, they tend to have that striping on them, but they might not necessarily have the striping on them depending on the water conditions and where they are. Um, sometimes I see them with barely any. Some of the times they have like a curve to the stripe. Sometimes it's straight, sometimes there's nothing. So it really depends, but for typically they have that little, they're shaped like a D, they're flat, or they have a little scoop in it. These are, quagga mussels right here and you can see how you can take pictures later I guess all right you can pass that around and this shows the different stages of them so this first one where it looks pretty just a little dirty this has some algae on it but if you look really closely you see these teeny tiny little dots those are the mussels that have just settled out of the water this is a little farther down the line of when they've grown a little bit more, and this is about 18 months later where they've like, they're fully formed at that point. So zebra mussels tend to be a little bit more triangular. We do not have zebra mussels here at this point, and the quaggas tend to be a little bit more rounded, but most people are not gonna be able to tell the difference to it, and they, they cause the same problems regardless of which species you have in your area. Like the Great Lakes tend to have more zebras than quaggas, but the quaggas are tending to take over more than the zebras now. Okay, and why are they highly invasive? They reproduce really, really fast. In, they've done studies in Lake Mead, which has very, very similar climate and water conditions that we have here. They reproduce every month of the year. As opposed to the Great Lakes, they reproduce one or two times a year. Put this into perspective, a female, every time she spawns, she releases about a million eggs. And that one female is doing a million eggs 12 times a year. That's a lot of mussels for just one. And these guys, they attach with these bissel threads. So they are, think of them as like little threads with little Gorilla Glue grips on the end. So they just grab on to whatever they want and they can pull themselves around if they want to just a little bit to position themselves where they want. But once they're on there, it is really difficult to remove them. And then they're filter feeders. So they are filtering pretty much everything and anything out of the water that they want. So they are a little bit picky though. They will filter stuff out and then if they don't like it, they'll spit it out. And it gets covered in this, anything they spit out gets covered in this mucus and it settles to the ground and that's what we call pseudo feces. So if you look at next to like a pile of quagga mussels on a rock in the lake, there's like this brown goo around them. That's their pseudo feces. That's the food they didn't want to eat. So they tend to be eating all the good stuff out of the water that like other species need to eat. Like um, this essentially comes down to they eat the fish's food or any other creature that needs that food. And they leave behind uh, other less desirable um, plankton in the water columns. So they're super tolerant of water. So they can, just above freezing, 
They can tolerate all the way up into the mid 80s. Uh, they can't, that's why we're not seeing them in some of the coves because those shallower coves, they tend to be hotter in the summer and they just don't do very well there at all. But if you think about what they're tolerant of, they can survive here year round, no problem, pretty much in any level in the lake for the most part. Um, although they can survive really cold temperatures, they can't survive freezing. So if, you were, uh, if the boat was up north and they happened to have quaggas up there, they would freeze to death, essentially. Okay, and they're super light sensitive, so they need the shady, dark places. So that's why they like to be lower in the water. They like to be under boats, under docks. Anywhere there's shade, they like to live. And any of nooks and crannies they can get into and grip on, that's what they really like. And they like a wide range of conditions. Every time we say they can't survive somewhere, they prove us wrong. And they end up surviving there. So we can go like that. So their life cycle is super important to understand and to especially explain to other boaters out there because this shows how, how easy it is to spread these around. So after the release, the eggs is released and fertilized, it becomes what we call a villager. And this is teeny, teeny, tiny. Uh, starting over here, so you got the egg sperm, it fertilizes, it grows a little bit. And then right around the 63 micron um, size, we can start detecting them in our nets. When we do plankton toes, we can start finding them at that point. Okay, to put into perspective how big 63 microns is, that's about the size of a shaft of hair like the diameter of a shaft of hair. So it's really, really small. It's hard to detect. And then they grow a little bit more, a little bit more and lure. And then right around like about two weeks or so, they start developing a little shell in the water. And they get a little bit too heavy. And they fall out of the water column. And they settle onto the ground. And at that, um, whatever substrate they're going to land on. And they um, send out those bissel threads and kind of secure themselves to whatever they're landed on. Uh, and that's what we call the settler juvenile stage. It's when they fall out of the water, land, and start gripping. And then the adults, they just start growing where they pretty much landed, but they do have the ability to move just a little bit to position themselves in the right spot, but for the most part, they stay where they are. And with the settling, it just makes this uh, feedback loop of villagers being released there's let's just say there's mussels there's a druid of mussels they release their eggs you have their larva they settle back and they tend to start start growing around each other and around each other and around each other so they're just reproducing more and more and more near each other and it's concentrating it so they just keep getting these bigger and bigger and bigger masses where they're living on top of each other that's what you can see on that end of that pipe they're just kind of like all climbing on top of each other and Going back to the villagers, we can't see them. But they're just floating around in the water. So when you're out boating, and if your boat pulls in any sort of water, whether it's intentional or not, there's potential of that larva being in there. And then you could t potentially take that water to another lake and inoculate a lake with those villagers, which would then settle down and grow into adults. Adult mussels, so they attach to any sort of hard surface, semi-hard surface, so any of those rocks on the bottom that have that nice thick coat of algae on it, they can s technically live on those as well. Um, so they're typically an inch or up to two inches. I've seen some pretty big ones come out of this lake and they form these dense clusters and live four to five years. So every once in a while, y there might be an ebb and flow in the population depending on if there's a die off of um, some of the age classes. And like I said before, one female produces one million eggs per spawn. That's a lot of eggs. And even if 10% of those survive, that's a lot of potential mussels that are in that lake. Okay, so where are they from? Quagga mussels are from the, the Diaspora River, which is in the Ukraine, um, which goes and drains into the Black Sea. Uh, zebra mussels were brought from the Caspian and Black Sea. The drainages that go into those is where they're from. They can tolerate some brackish water and uh, the Black and the Caspian Seas tend to have moderately brackish water. And the shipping containers, um, sorry, the shipping, the big shipping boats, they would 
suck up that water for their ballast to level out their loads and go across the ocean. And when they would get to the Great Lakes, they would dump their water as they're unloading to balance everything out again. So in that water that they're sucking up is anything that we probably don't want here, whether it's quagga mussels or it's plants or it's um, some sort of planktonic creature. Any of that stuff is potentially carried across the ocean and dumped. But vice versa, a lot of our stuff goes over to them as well. So it goes both ways. So they got here, like I said, they came from Europe. They, the larvae and the jelts, they came over and they colonized in the Great Lakes. So they were found in 88 in St. Clair, um, which is pretty much smack dab in the middle of the Great Lakes. Um, and then a couple years later, they found the quagga mussels. Well, they may, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing, like who came first? Did we find the zebra mussels and then we found the quaggas or did they arrive at the same time? Either way, it doesn't matter. Um, zebra mussels are very widespread in the Great Lakes and now so are quagga mussels as well. Um, even though quagga mussels tend to be doing a lot better than zebras because they're a little bit more adaptable. So in 88, it was just this little section right there around Lake Erie and uh, Lake Michigan. And then very quickly, they spread farther and farther and farther. And you're starting to know these little stars out west where they found dead mussels. So we're into the 2000s now. And then 2007, they found quagga, live quagga mussels. Um, we are going on the 10 year anniversary of that this January, in matter of fact. And very quickly after they found them in Lake Mead, they found them pretty much everywhere south of there on the river. So Mojave, Havasu, uh, all the way down the river to Yuma, they found quagga mussels, unfortunately. And from there, they spread to a few other places. They got some hits, like in Colorado and California. So this one just breaks it down by species. And quaggas are green. Yellow is both. Red is zebra. Uh, there are zebra mussels, if you notice, over in California on a little reservoir there. They have closed that reservoir to all boating. Nobody can use it. And they decided to do that because it is a drinking source. It's just pretty much a municipal drinking source. So they decided that's what they wanted to do in that place, unfortunately. But for the most part, most other waterways in California and across the West are still open. Uh, there are a lot of those green hits down in Southern California is because they receive water from the Colorado River at one point. So they were easily contaminated. And then there's a few more green dots over near our Phoenix area. So Lake Pleasant, the, Sil the Salt River Lakes, like uh, Canyon, Saguaro, and Apache also have them as well, as well as all of the canal systems down there. And then there's a few more hits, but you've, you notice maybe that some of those hits in Cal um, Colorado have disappeared. They were getting, they got, you can become delisted at a point. If you get like a positive hit on like um, when they do a plankton toe and they do villager counts or they do a DNA PCR test, um, if you get like a positive hit, you have to go X amount of time without having another hit and then you can become delisted. Because typically it takes a few inoculations for your waterway to actually get a full on invasion. The impacts are something you really, it's a really good thing to drive home with people because essentially if it affects people's way of life and affects them personally, they're gonna pay attention a little bit more. Um, especially if it's economic and it goes straight for their wallet. Um, their muscles are incredibly expensive. They, people um, across the country, they spend over a billion dollars a year in maintenance. And that's a very, very, very conservative number. It's probably a lot more because the way they track expenses, especially like in power plants and water infrastructure, um, but it's super expensive. They have to scrape, they have to shut down, they have to rebuild pumps. It's very, very expensive. And then docks, buoys, and boats, they're always getting covered, so they have to be cleaned and removed, and parts have to be replaced, and you know, on and on and on. And it's very, very expensive. Not only in money, but in time as well. And then removal is a huge issue because those infrastructures, boats, everything has to be removed. Again, super expensive. Manual labor is super, super expensive. Um, and then 
that hinders any sort of recreational boating you might have. So that's going to slow you down on the ramps, right? You're going to have to stop and make sure your boat is clean. You pull your plug. That takes time. Um, some people might not want to go boating because you've now impacted their free time. And then any sort of any of those dead muscles that we were talking about earlier, those shells wash up on shore. And they can cut people's feet. They're very, very sharp. If you can see on there, they're like little razor blades. Um, and then it can impact if fishing. Not only will they consume the plankton that the fish could potentially be eating, but they degrade any sort of um, um, substrate that affects the fish's habitat for the most part. And ecologically, um, because they're selective filter feeders, they, again, they eat that fish food. They leave undesirable um, food in the water. So it really disrupts other native species and such. Uh, because they're the filter feeders and they're taking that plankton out of the water again, they're clearing up that water, which is great aesthetically. It's great to have clear water. And we had beautifully clear water here for very many years. But if you might have noticed over the last few years, it's been getting quite green. And we also have a lot of plant overgrowth now because the water is clear. Uh, and then it can also affect the taste and odor of the water. Uh, we haven't had that problem here so much, but it is always a potential issue. Uh, mussels stink. I can't even describe the smell, but they're stinky, especially when they start breaking down. Management eradication is almost impossible. So once we have them, I like to drive home the point of once you have them somewhere, you can't get rid of them. So the only thing we can do is keep them here. And that's why we're having you guys clean your boats, drain your boats so you don't go and infect another lake nearby. Eradication is impossible. Um, it's almost impossible. It's very, very difficult. We do not have that silver bullet yet. So we need to do these measures of clean, drain, and dry, and decon until we can find that silver bullet that will just take care of these guys. Um, our best defense is that prevention and containment. Again, that clean, drain, and dry. And education is the biggest thing to reduce the risk of these spread. The more people that know, the more people that care, the more people that do, the less likely we are to spread these things. Whether it's through outreach, surveys, special events, uh, word of mouth, anything really. Just get the word out. All right, so we have other AIS in Arizona and especially in Lake Havasu. I'm going to concentrate more on what we have in this immediate area, um, north and south of here, that you might run across or people might have questions about along the way. All right, we went through this before with the director's orders. Of, this is the statewide map. And here is just a blow up of basically from Lake Mead just to below Parker Dam. So Lake Mead, they have uh, Eurasian, I'm sorry, quagga mussels, curly pond weed, and New Zealand mud snails. Um, the same with Lake Mojave, uh, just below so like Willow Beach area, we have some Eurasian milfoil, water milfoil in there. Uh, below Davis Dam, we got that Didymo again. We got the quagga mussels. We have Eurasian milfoil there. Down in Havasu, so here. Quagga mussels, curly pond weed, and Eurasian water milfoil. And below Parker Dam, again, quagga mussels and Eurasian water milfoil. Um, the plants, the curly pond weed and the Eurasian water milfoil, we found in the last couple years. Um, we don't know how long it's been here. It's just when we, we started noticing it. Um, so I'll go into that a little bit more as we move along. All right, New Zealand mud snails. Teeny, 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 tiny. Like you can fit 100 of them on the face of a dime. They're that small. Um, these are a concern because they degrade. Um, you might hear about them a lot more if you are a fisherman and you have waders. Um, a lot of times felt bottom waders have been banned in some places, not in Arizona, but in other states. They have certain restrictions on what waders you can use because you can potentially carry New Zealand mud snails and other sort of other diseases from stream to stream to stream. Um, these guys get stuck in your shoes. So if you got any, anywhere on the bottom of your shoes, they get stuck in those little cracks and crevices and you can just drag them from one place to the other. Every time I go to Lake Mojave and I tend to always find them in my shoes, regardless of how well I think I've cleaned my shoes. I clean them again and again and again and keep finding them. Um, we don't have them here, and I don't want them here. Um, 
because we do have a lot of native snails here that we would prefer to keep, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, and most of the time they're spread through like fishing gear and sometimes from um, aquarium dumps as well. Dynamo, rock. this is also known as rock snot. It is gross. Um, it's the slimy, oozy goo. It's a diatom and it has multiple forms and in its grossest form it has this snot-like brown goo. Um, sometimes it's when it's not in a full-blown outbreak it's just these stringy little white strings you might see in the water. Uh, we haven't had a huge bloom up at um, Bullhead lately but um, when I'm up there from time to time I still do see like the little streaky pieces so it's still present in the area. Um, this is different than the brown goo that we have on our rocks here because um, that is a combination of freshwater sponges, um, a different diatom, and algae. Those things are all supposed to be here. So these are different things that look similar. So this stuff basically smothers out the bottom, degrades the fish habitat, and it's just disgusting. People don't like it. They don't want to fish in it. They don't want to swim in it. It's just not really pleasing. So and the, you basically you have to clean your fishing gear or any sort of raft or anything that you use there for that. Curly pondweed. Uh, I found this here two years ago now. Just happened to be out on a patrol with a um, local wildlife manager. Guy pulls up his fishing line. What's on the end of your line, sir? <laughs> so this was a new find for us. Um, this is one of the many other species of plants we have in the lake now. Um, we're probably just noticing now, especially with the big uh, overgrowth of plants that we have because the water is clear, more light penetrates, more plants are able to grow. We're starting to notice things that we weren't noticing before. Um, so all of these plant species have one thing in common. They all, when they fragment and break, that little piece has the potential to grow into a brand new plant. So that's why when we ask people to remove the weeds off of their boats, that they're getting as much off as possible because the teeny tiny little piece on there can grow into a full grown plant somewhere else. It doesn't take very much. And we're worried, um, these, you've seen the mats of the dead plant material on top of the water in the end of the summer, right? A lot of places will get that even with water it growing underneath and it gets really thick and people have problems swimming in it and um, sometimes if it gets thick enough the fish can't swim in it very well either. Um, it slows down water. That can increase the amount of mosquitoes you have in an area because now you have still water. You can have problems with mosquitoes and whatever disease the mosquitoes decide to carry. So these just all kind of feed off each other and cause more problems. Eurasian water milfoil. This is very common in much of the US. We do have it here. Uh, this one fragments very, 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 very easily. And it really doesn't take very much of it to, um, to actually proliferate other places. Uh, we're worried about the fragments with this one the most because it breaks so easily. And because it's so light, it just floats really, really easily and it's really easy to spread. Whether it's from the wind or you're catching it on your boat, um, you can take it anywhere and it can grow almost anywhere. So again, it makes those big mats, it slows down the water, it can decrease the amount of oxygen when it starts breaking down and really affect the water chemistry where it starts harming other creatures in the water. Uh, but we have native species here as well. So the sago pondweed, the spiny naiad, and like chara, we do have a few other species in this lake, but for the most part, these are the ones you're gonna see the most. Um, the sago pondweed, this is the one that you typically see when people come out of Windsor in the summer and it looks like they have grass skirts on there. That's what a lot of that is. But these have the potential of having mussels that have settled on them, that start to grow on them. So those weeds have live mussels in them. If they don't clean those mussels, now you're dragging live mussels and nice damp material anywhere. And as long as they're damp, they can still survive. Um, 
people do get stopped and quarantined at those ag stations because they have plant materials that happen to have a muscle on them. So one more thing, the reason, even though they're not native, they, these are native plants, it's still part of that whole clean drain and dry because these might, plants might cause potential harm somewhere else as well where it's not native. So like I said, if it's native, clean drain and dry still applies. So we want no plants, no animals, no mud when we clean these boats. And this is a picture of 184 different non-native species that the Great Lakes have. Any of these potentially could come here. We don't want that. We only have a few. So that's why we all have to work together. We all have the same message across the country of keep your stuff where it is. So how do we prevent the spread and what are the impacts? So when we were talking about, so how do the plants and the quagga mussels they all feed off each other. So we got these quagga mussels eventually. Um, this is a, kind of a decent talking point if you're trying to move through all of the material with them relatively quickly. Cause you know, how long are we really talking to people? A couple minutes, really, if that. Um, okay, so we got the quagga mussels. They, incre they increase the water. People are like, yay, great, clear water. Oh no, but now we have vegetation. Yeah, my pontoon bunks are all covered in vegetation. Yeah, that's because of the quagga mussels. Increase the light, yeah. increase the light um, penetrating the water. So we got more plants. So that vegetation grows and it possibly increases the amount of invasive species we have because more light in the water, more potential for plant growth or whatever plant growth that was already there uh, can now grow up and proliferate a lot easier. We get those floating mats. What's People don't like swimming in them. You don't want a boat in them because they just muck everything up. Increase in mosquitoes and other problems that go with it. So you get the decrease in aesthetic value. People don't like that. And then it increases costs. Costs you money to fix your boat if it gets clogged with weeds, right? Costs you money to, just in the time it takes to clean all that stuff off of your boat, right? All of our time costs, rather if it's monetarily or not. Um, these weeds, they're especially costly, um, down at the central Arizona park where they have the pump, pump stations for years and years and years, they were just scooping the weeds out of the water every single day. And they were spending millions of dollars just scooping weeds out just so they wouldn't clog their pipes or their pumps. Um, they now have, they just spent millions of dollars on these trash racks so they can literally like pull them out rather than having a backhoe scooping them every day. So they're spending millions just because of the weeds that grew up because we got mussels that never used to be a problem. So, super expensive. Um, because eventually this hits their wallets, whether it's for their power bill or their water bill, uh, sewer bill, these things cost money and companies are going to pass it on to the customer. They always do. Because um, they're in it for the money. So. Eventually it'll get to them. So other negative... Kind of already gone over this, but um, it's going to disrupt everything in the native sy natural system um, and things like that. All right, so if you want to talk money, because that's normally what people pay attention to is money, money, money. Um, they spend, people across this country, about $9 billion annually just on environmental damage and control costs for invasive species in general. $9 billion. They're probably being very conservative on that number. That's a lot. Just think of how many power plants, hydro dams, um, water systems that's affecting. It costs everyone a lot of money. They think uh, about five and a half billion dollars is harming the fish. Just the cost of that. Zebra mussels, they say one billion. That's way too low, to be honest. They spend 500 million on controlling plant growth. Um, and then you have the problems with the tourism. Do you wanna, do people really wanna recreate in places where there's these issues with the water or the, um, if you close down a lake, you decrease um, tourism, things like that. 
and it can uh, decrease prop um, property values. Do you think property values would be this high if all of our tourists went away? Obviously not. So, and then uh, a lot of people's um, property values go down because of just aesthetics. Like if they get a lot of weeds in front of their waterfront homes, the aesthetic value, and then it just drops their uh, property values as well. So how do we prevent this spread? And this things we have to keep driving home to people. We need them to clean, remove those mud and plants and animals, drain, remove the plugs, any sort of standing water in that boat. Dry, we want them to dry at least five days if they're going between different waterways within the state. And then if they've been in the water for over six days, they need to call me, call me. Well, you're not gonna be crawling on people's boats to show them stuff obviously but I would like for you when you're out there talking to people that you are able to point out different parts of the boat like oh you missed a whole clump of weeds here oh you have a plug there um, we need to have you pull that you know this and that if you can point out what people need to do eventually you don't have to because now they know what to do so um, and regardless of if it's a it's a pleasure craft or it's a kayak, there's still always a potential of them carrying some sort of AIS on their boats. 